Welcome, my name is Bonnie Wepler and I am the Executive Director of the Church Council on Justice and Corrections. I'm so pleased that you are participating in this Justice Storytelling Quilt presentation. It will take me just a minute to get the Justice Storytelling Quilt up on the screen. And here we are. The Justice Storytelling Quilt is a project of the Church Council on Justice and Corrections, CCJC for short. CCJC has had a number of projects over the years, but I have always found the Justice Storytelling Quilt to be quite impactful. I come from a long line of quilters, although I am not one, but this is a unique, a unique quilt and the stories that it shares are important. Warning. During this presentation, I will read six of the quilt stories, but the quilt contains 40 stories, so you will have a lot of stories still to explore. Let me read the quilt's first story. It was 1999. My father and mother were driving back from Montreal. They had been visiting my grandparents there. They met a car head on, traveling the wrong way down the Queensway, and it transpired that Eve had been drinking. His alcohol level was nearly three times the legal limit. He had narrowly missed two other cars, forcing them off the road first. But he actually hit my parents' car, just about head on, just about at the driver's windscreen pillar. My father was instantly killed and my mother, who was in the passenger seat, was largely unscathed. Drunk drivers tend to be very much demonized in the press. And my first impression of Eve was, here was just a regular guy. The two, from my perspective, were very different things. There was the criminal or the normal societal process that Eve was going through, which had penalties associated with it. And then there was what we were trying to do through the restorative system. As part of the criminal system, the family was asked for their feelings about sentencing and they have the impact statement, the victim impact statement. So I actually canvassed the broader family and got the broad spectrum from hang, them, hang him high to the, it's not really worth it, putting him in jail. What are you achieving by that? The consensus was that we actually recommended two years less a day. And Eve found that very difficult because on one hand, I was recommending that he have a custodial sentence, which is something that he was very frightened of. And yet, on the other hand, we were working together through the restorative system to try and make amends and do something beneficial. And they are very separate, but of course for him, they're not. What I wanted to do more than anything else and what I looked for the restorative justice to try and do was to produce something useful from what was otherwise a complete mess. My father had retired. He was very much involved in his community and his church. He was really enjoying life. He was getting to know his grandchildren. And so it was a complete waste, a very talented man. The inspiration was the first kiss quilt. The inter this, interactive first kilt, this interactive first kiss quilt led to the idea. And the idea was that there should be an interactive justice storytelling quilt, highlighting the experiences of victims, offenders, and community members through the lens of restorative justice. The then executive director, Lorraine, contacted the first Kiss Quilt artist, Megan, and from there, there was no going back. Je suis tombé en dépression. Je suis un gars qui a travaillé beaucoup trop, qui a travaillé toute ma vie, puis je faisais mon deuxième burn-out, 
puis j'étais en dépression. J'avais été voir le médecin pour lui dire que ces antidépresseurs, ils causaient des absences. Mais comme je suis déjà diplômé en psychologie, puis j'avais un certificat en toxicomanie, on m'a dit que je voulais me soigner moi-même. Je ne l'ai pas vraiment cru, puis ça restait comme ça. Puis effectivement, j'ai eu. Il y a un jour, j'ai décidé d'arrêter parce que j'avais trop d'absence. Je ne me souvenais plus de mes journées. Je n'étais plus capable d'écrire sur l'ordinateur. Je n'étais plus capable de rien dire. fait que j'ai arrêté de prendre mes antidépresseurs. Puis j'ai eu deux, deux jours d'absence complète. Puis j'ai recommencé à boire. Eh bien, je pense que j'ai recommencé à boire, je ne suis pas sûre. Et j'ai eu un accident en état d'ébriété. J'ai tué deux enfants. Et puis, j'ai toujours cru que la société était là pour aider les gens, soigner les gens et apporter un support. Ce n'est pas même, même que je croyais du système carcéral. Mes croyances étaient que les gens avaient un support. Il y avait d'interventions qui étaient faites pour la rééducation au lieu que, que la punition. OK, wow, je suis encore là parce que je me suis senti trahi du système. Le système, non seulement ne m'a pas compris, mais ont triché. Parce que quand je suis passé en cours, les policiers ont perdu ma dosette de médicaments. Ils sont allés chercher les dossiers chez Jean Coutu. Mes dossiers médic médicaux, ils étaient dans leur ordinateur, ils sont perdus. Mes dossiers aussi à la clinique familiale, ils sont perdus et j'ai plus de preuves. Je suis coincé. Ça faisait quatre ans, je n'étais plus en contact avec moi-même. Puis après, j'ai fait la justice réparatrice là. Je m'ai senti vivre, je m'ai senti moi-même, parce que justement, il y avait quelqu'un qui m'a compris. Comment que ça m'a aidé, c'est que j'ai regardé les gens. J'ai eu peur de ces gens-là. C'était des gens qui avaient souffert comme moi. C'était des gens qui ont souffert à cause des individus comme moi. Mais c'est ces mêmes personnes-là qui m'ont cru, qui m'ont écouté, qui m'ont entendu, mais sur surtout qui m'ont cru. Ces mêmes personnes-là m'ont dit qu'eux autres aussi avaient peur des mêmes préjugés que moi, de ne pas être entendus, de ne pas être compris. Et c'est ça qui m'a fait du bien. J'ai vu que je n'étais pas tout seul. For those of you who aren't fluent in French, I will read the English translation. I fell into a depression. I'm a guy who worked too much, who worked all my life, and I was starting my second burnout and I was depressed. I went to see the doctor to tell him that the antidepressants were causing me to lose days at work. But because I had a degree in psychology and a certificate in drug addiction studies, They told me that I was trying to treat myself. I really didn't believe it, and, well, things stayed that way. In reality, I had it. One day I decided to stop taking the medication because I was missing too much work. I couldn't remember what was happening from day to day. I was no longer able to write using the computer. I was no longer able to say anything. So I stopped taking the antidepressants. Then I was off work for two full days and I started drinking again. And well, I think I started drinking again. I'm not sure. I had an accident when I was inebriated. I killed two children. And I always thought that society was there to help people, take care of people and be supportive. You know, it's not. I even believed that about the prison system. I believed that the people had support, that there were interventions like re-education, not punishment. Okay, wow, I'm still there. Because I, I feel betrayed by the system. The system not only didn't understand me, it cheated. Because when I went to court, the police had lost my medication organizer from the drugstore. They went to the John Coutu drugstore to get my files. My medical files that were in their computer, they lost them. Also my files at the family medical clinic, they were lost and I had no more proof. I was stuck. 
For four years, I was disconnected from myself. Then afterwards, I took part in the restorative justice there. I start to live, I started to feel like myself because just before, there was someone who understood me. How it helped me is that I looked at people. I was afraid of those people. They were people who had suffered like me. They were people who had suffered because of individuals like me. But it's those same people who believed me, who listened to me, who heard me, but most importantly, they believed me. Those same people told me that they were also afraid of the same prejudices as me, to not be heard, to not be understood. And that's what made me feel better. I saw that I wasn't alone. 40 victims, offenders, and community members came together at various penitentiaries and other spaces throughout Canada to create their blocks. Participants used different materials, including pieces of baby quilts, photographs, a triathlon ribbon, a feather, beads. A number of the blocks contained similar images, such as the sun, flowers, hearts, and people, all of which seemed to be quite positive images. There are two languages in the quilt. 27 of the blocks are in English and 13 of the blocks are in French. J'ai dû appeler ma mère pour lui annoncer que mon frère, parce que mon frère ne lui avait pas dit. J'allais visiter mon frère. Mon neveu, je suis pas allé parce que il a eu très peu de sentence à cause que lui, il avait de l'argent, il travaillait. Eh bien, malheureusement, je trouve que le système de justice, il n'est pas toujours très juste. Alors, mon neveu, il a eu seulement quatre mois d'incarcération. Mon fils en a eu deux ans moins un jour, puis mon frère a eu les 42 mois. Moi, j'avais annoncé mes couleurs à mon fils. J'avais dit, « Toi, je vais continuer à t'encourager, mais ce que tu fais, je ne l'accepte pas. » Donc, si tu te mets les pieds dans les plats encore et que j'apprends ça, je dénoncerai. Ça, c'est difficile pour une mère de faire ça. Sauf que, à quelque part, il faut être, je pense qu'il faut être conséquent avec ce qu'on dit. Aujourd'hui, mon fils, il est sorti. Il commence à avoir, à avoir une vie rangée. Il commence à être mieux, à comprendre les choses qu'il n'avait pas compris. Puis, il me remercie souvent en disant que si je n'avais pas fait ce que j'avais fait, aujourd'hui, il ne sait pas où il serait rendu. Peut-être qu'il serait rendu à faire du temps encore plus long. The English translation. Um, I had to call my mother to tell her because my brother hadn't told her. I went to see my brother. My nephew, I didn't go because he had a short sentence, because he had money, he was working. And unfortunately, I find the justice system is not always very just. So my nephew, he got a sentence of only four months incarceration. My son got two years less a day and my brother got 42 months. Me, I told my son exactly what I thought. I told him, you, I will continue to support you, but what you are doing, I don't accept it. So if you start trouble again and I find out about it, I'll turn you in. That, that's difficult for a mother to do, except that one way or another, it has to be, I think, we have to follow through on what we say. Today, my son, he's out. He is starting to have an orderly life. He is starting to feel better to understand the things he didn't understand before. And he thanks me often and says that if I hadn't done what I did today, he doesn't know where he would be. Maybe he would be doing a longer prison sentence. The purpose of the quilt.
We humanize justice by hearing people speak from their hearts about what they have been through and what they need to help them recover. Our son Jeff, who was 13, almost 14 at the time, got off the school bus with a group of friends and were walking along the side of the road to go to a friend's house. When around the corner came a vehicle that was going too fast, lost control and drove right into this group of kids. They were all in shock, so got up, shook themselves off, and went to the friend's house anyway. He built this person into kind of a monster. He was having bad dreams. He kept seeing the car coming because he stood and watched the vehicle come and hit him. The program got this circle arranged. To me, that was justice, that this boy, this 19 year old was able to hear us and hear our fears as parents and the pain of the boys. So he ceased being a monster, but then just became a child who had made an incredibly bad decision. And when Jeff was talking about seeing the car come and hitting him, the driver was saying he saw the car going to Jeff and seeing Jeff on, his, on the hood of his car and in his windshield. He'd been having nightmares about the same thing. So we all went to court and asked the judge if she would agree to drop, to drop the criminal charge. Creating the quilt and their individual blocks helped these victims, offenders, and community members to find understanding and meaning, and that life can be good and worth living despite the suffering and horror they have been through. This is our big news. The Justice Storytelling Quilt is now accessible around the world. A click on any patch will activate a two minute audio testimony by its designer, describing the sorrowful event that took place in his or her life. May the quilt inspire us and give us courage to talk about the sorrowful events in our own lives. We ask that you hold sacred the stories that you hear. November 18th, 1990. Our family was awakened in the middle of the night by pounding on our front door. And as we left the house, we realized that our house was on fire. My mom and dad were out there and I was out there. And we realized that my sister was still in the house. My mom ran back in or made an attempt to run back in. We tried to hold her back. She ran. She eventually broke free and she ran back in. There was this loud explosion and everything went, had gone silent. She had been screaming for my sister. My sister and my mother were killed in that fire. Ultimately, he received an eight year sentence for manslaughter for my sister's death and a six year sentence for criminal negligence in my mother's death. And the two sentences were to be served concurrently. Okay, I need to do this. I need to face this monster that I created in my mind, basically. The monster that I had known wasn't a monster anymore. He was taking responsibility for it. He became a person. Here's what I'm giving you. I know I'm not angry at you anymore. You've given me the answers I need. We both learned a lot from what's happened. And I just need to give you this, this thing called forgiveness, as a way for me to move on with my life too which is to free myself of the anger and the hurt. We have a number of acknowledgements. As you can imagine, there was a lot that had to go in to create this quilt. As well as Le Centre de Service de Justice Reparatrice, the Centre for Services in Restorative Justice, a number of other organizations across Canada also identified and organized participants to share their stories. 
Suzanne David Shantz quilted all the pieces together. David made the quilt talk. Making the quilt talk is interesting. There were a bunch of wirings going in between the front and the back panels of the quilt. When the quilt was set up, you could actually touch the block and the person's story would be told. That technology is long gone, although I still have the wiring in the office. Otherwise, the physical quilt is still in very good shape and not actually touching the quilt block and the quilt blocks anymore will help to increase its longevity and it can still travel. In order to make the quilt talk before it was digitalized, we had the stories on a USB key and we traveled with a computer and we clicked on which story the person wanted to hear. Having the quilt digitalized still means that we need to carry a computer or access someone else's computer, but it's online and that makes it so much easier to set up. We thank the 40 brave people who came forward to share their stories. We got funding from the Women's Interchurch Council of Canada for the digitalization of the quilt. Mohab Hanna was our IT person to ensure that the quilt worked perfectly. And a friend read the two French stories in this presentation. Okay. My daughter Tara was working alone in a Subway sandwich shop in Calgary and was attacked during the robbery and beaten to death with a four pound sledgehammer. It was just, it was a guy that wanted money for his crack cocaine addiction. He beat a person at a bank machine 45 minutes before that. Three gang members or three taxi drivers about two weeks before that. It was a rampage. And plus he was a career criminal. He had, I think they said, 45 convictions for different things. And we went through the trial and petitioned the government to make it mandatory that more than one person be in a work environment, that safety precautions be taken. Before Tara died, BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, there's quite a few provinces that did some sort of a regulation and Alberta did nothing. The government finally did pass a regulation and all it says is an employer must do everything in their power to eliminate, if not minimize, the risk to people. And that's so, it hasn't gone far enough yet, but we're not giving up. The city of Calgary, right after that, they had demanded, they'd actually called it Tara's Law. And that, and a lot of places, had taken it upon themselves just to do it. And that, so I mean, it's a start. And it brought the awareness in that, but I don't know whether I talked to the right person or what, but I had, like I said, phone corrections Canada and said, okay, I want a visit. We were there from, I don't know, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. It was helpful. I think on both parts. Mine, because I got a lot of questions answered that you don't hear about in the trial. And I think, I can't speak for him, but I think it helped him because he didn't realize there were victims. He says, I've never met any victims before. And I said, well, like my daughter died, there's myself, her sisters, her family. There's four people in Calgary that are brain damaged because of him. I don't know whether it's lucky they survived or not because they're just not the same. And he got life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years. And somewhere in that 18 years, he'll have to do some type of rehab. I think the victims are serving more of a life sentence than, you know, because we do have a life sentence. You have a life sentence without whoever you've lost. Where, like I say, he didn't realize that he'd left that many victims or, you know, and 
I don't think he has the kind of comprehension and I'm sure he's not the only one who doesn't realize what they've done. You know, people say, when are you going to get on with it? Your life never goes back to the way it was six years ago. I mean, I've got on with it, but it will be, it's a different life. The quilt is available for events in Canada. It has been across Canada, but it is still willing to travel. Contact me if the quilt can make your event extra special. Let me introduce you a bit more to the Church Council and Justice on Justice and Corrections. Our vision statement. And our mission statement. Our mandate drives what we do and how we do it. A little bit of our history, some of our history highlights. The creation of the council. The creation of the council for the study of the responsibility and action of the churches in the fields of justice and corrections doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. It's a very long title. That's what it was created in August 1972. And one of the biggest campaigns that CCJC worked on in the early years was the debate against uh, the, the debate on the death penalty in Canada. The name gets significantly shorter in 1983, and we are still the Church Council on Justice and Corrections. In French, it's Le Conseil des Églises pour la Justice et la Criminologie. In 1998, we piloted the Collaborative Justice Program. That was an early project of the Church Council on Justice and Correction in 1998. The purpose of the pilot was to demonstrate that the application of a restorative approach in cases of serious adult or youth crime would provide for a more satisfying experience of justice for all parties involved, for the victims, offenders, and the community. The Collaborative Justice Program continues to be one of the primary restorative justice program uh, providers in Ottawa, and it runs out of the Ottawa Courthouse. If you go to the Collaborative Justice Program website, you can read stories from victims and offenders. 2005 is when the Justice Storytelling Quilt came into being. Uh, 2010 to 15, uh, the Church Council on Justice and Corrections was involved in a five-year national demonstration project for Circles of Support and Accountability, shortened to COSA. COSA was created in Hamilton, Ontario in 1994. It's a Canadian-made program, which is now in numerous countries around the world. COSA is an organization which, which helps sex offenders coming out of prisons. The offender is surrounded by a circle of three or four volunteers. The volunteers give guidance to the offender, help the offender get up to speed with the world and technology after having been in prison, and act as intentional friends. As someone coming out of prison, there are usually multiple needs, such as finding housing, finding housing, getting documents such as driver's license, birth certificates, if they've been lost in the transitions, etc. At the time of the evaluation in 2010 to 15, there were 18 COSA sites across Canada. Currently, there are 15 sites, Abbotsford, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, Prince Albert, Winnipeg, Peterborough, Toronto, Hamilton, Kitchener, Ottawa, Montreal, Moncton, and Halifax. The Victim Impact Pro Program is in a number of the prisons and it works with offenders so that they better understand impacts of their actions on themselves and others. It is hoped that this understanding will reduce recidivism. 
The Empathy Project is a curriculum created for incarcerated women. The curriculum is similar, but not the same as the Victim Impact Project. The Empathy Project is based around 13 chapters. The first introduces community justice, restorative justice. The second chapter talks about cultural barriers. And the third chapter talks about media impact. The rest of the chapters focus on issues that might have caused a woman to be incarcerated, such as property crime and theft, substance abuse, domestic violence, homicide, etc. There is a chapter on forgiveness and making amends. The 13th chapter, the lucky chapter, is the celebration chapter, focusing on the success of the participants. The Empathy Project was piloted at Grand Valley Institution in Kitchener, Ontario in 2019. Next up for the Empathy Project, we have a student committed from September 2020 to April 2021 to start the creation of a youth empathy project. So the student will identify issues specific to youth and start the research. We're very excited. We have two upcoming events and one of them is the 15th anniversary of the Justice Storytelling Quilt. The other is our 50th anniversary in August 2022. We'll be having a party. If you have questions, I am going to set up a Zoom meeting for Monday, August 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that would be Ontario, Canada time. If you want to participate in the Zoom question period, contact me at info at ccjc.ca and I will send you the link so that you can participate. Thank you so very much for your interest in the Justice Storytelling Quilt and the Church Council on Justice and Corrections. Have a wonderful day.